Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is David Posner. Um, welcome to the IET Sussex uh, meeting for Tuesday, 18th of May. Um, I'll let Daniel introduce the speaker. Over to you, Daniel, if you want to introduce the speaker. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, this joint event for IET Sussex and the Automobile Division Southern Centre. Um, as Dave mentioned, um, I'll, um, I'll pass you over to our, uh, our, our speaker very shortly. Um, once the uh, presentation is finished, um, we will do our best to uh, make our way through uh, your questions uh, as you type them into the Q&A section. Um, and uh, yes, and we'll, we'll see, make sure that we can get through as many of those as possible. Um, so yes, let me introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, Dr. Maxime Flement is uh, Chief Technology Officer of the 5G Automotive Association, uh, which is a global cross-industry association for the development of end-to-end -end vehicular connectivity solutions. Uh, Maxime has almost 25 years of experience in both automotive and telecommunications research and innovation. He holds a PhD and MSc uh, from Chalmers Technical University, um, as well as an MSc from the Free University of Brussels. Uh, in 2001, uh, he was visiting researcher at Stanford University. Um, so thank you very much for uh, speaking to, the, to us this evening, Maxime, um, and I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, making sure that we, I can share this screen and here we go. Uh, do you? Yes, I can see your screen. And do you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, now I hear you very, very faintly and so for some reason. Okay, great. So hello from my side. My name is Maxime Flamand and I'm uh, the Chief Technology Officer for 5G AA. Uh, and I'm very happy to give this presentation at this uh, Sussex Online, uh, IET Sussex Online uh, webinar. And, and that actually that uh, meeting was planned quite a long time ago and then uh, we, uh, never uh, got to do it uh, because of this uh, COVID uh, situation. And so eventually now we are doing it uh, remotely. So um, the presentation will be about automotive connectivity in a 5G world. And um, I have actually not timed my presentation. So I hope that it's going to hold within an hour and then we have 30 minutes of, uh, of questions. Uh, so let me. <clears throat> so first, let me introduce 5G Automotive Association. It's a global cross-industry organization. It brings together the voice of the automotive uh, uh, and telecommunication industry. And the uh, association is working on um, defining and developing, uh, as, as it was said at the introduction, end-to-end -end, uh, solutions for future mobility, but also all the way to automation uh, and automated vehicles. Um, we uh, cover all aspects of the uh, what we call cellular V2X, uh, including obviously the, the technology and the standards, but also allocation of spectrums, uh, aspects about policy and regulations around the world. And uh, when needed, we start doing some hands-on testing, the security aspects, uh, and we talk about together about the go-to-market strategies and business models in order to um, uh, tackle the uh, different markets around the world. Our main markets are US, Europe, and China, but uh, obviously we are also looking at um, Korea, uh, Japan, Australia, um, and um, North America in general. So, um, so pretty broad uh, uh, scope. A geographic scope and um, uh, that requires actually a global partnership that, that's uh, uh, quickly from 2016 we had eight founding uh, companies and we grew uh, to a global cross-industry association of uh, 125 members today 
uh, and um, it shows here 13 of the top 15 OEMs, nine of the top 10 MNOs, and uh, three of the top uh, smartphone vendors. When, when I'm talking about MNOs, I'm talking about the, uh, in terms of gross uh, revenue, um, not necessarily in terms of a subscriber, obviously, because otherwise we would have regions like China, uh, uh, India or others. Okay, um, so 5GA, I mentioned uh, the cellular V2X. So we really think that these mobile communication standards for vehicle connectivity represented, represent the best opportunity to deliver CITS service. Uh, and that we want to do it uh, in a quick manner, in a, go, in a, in a, in a smart a go to market way and at scale on every road, um, whereas uh, other, other ways to do it are perhaps uh, require perhaps a 10 years uh, uh, introduction and penetration gap that we are, we cannot afford. So it, it is uh, uh, it is um, uh, it enables comprehensive road safety and traffic efficiency solutions, and uh, it um, enables the vehicles to connect it with each other, uh, as shown here between the two vehicles with the road uh, side equipment, uh, with the other uh, cyclists and pedestrians. And very importantly, all this is complemented by the uh, connection to the mobile network for all sorts of service offered via the internet. Let me introduce you to what we call cellular vehicle to everything or CV2X. It's this family of technologies that allows vehicles to really connect with their surroundings. Your car becomes a moving data center that can share the information captured by its sensors with the entire transport ecosystem, making it safer and more efficient. The beauty of CV2X is that your car can basically talk to another car by sending a quick message through what we call CV2X Direct Communications. This works even when there's no network. All right, let me give you an example. So imagine you're about to make a left turn, but a speeding car is incoming in your blind spot. Your car will anticipate and alert you in real time, avoiding a potential crash. And it doesn't even stop there, because that's when the CV2X mobile network communications mode comes in. Sending messages via the cellular network, it can relay information to even more distant cars creating a whole transport ecosystem that's safer and intelligent. A traffic jam two kilometers ahead? Your car will know and plan its journey long before you could. And what's great is that it's not only cars that can receive the message. It's transport infrastructure, it's pedestrians and cyclists through their mobile devices. Can you imagine the implications? Already today, there are more than 180 million connected cars that have the ability to operate basic V2X applications via existing 4G and LTE cellular networks. From 2020, LTE V2X Direct Communications has begun enabling more safety and traffic efficiency applications. But to make advanced safety and automated driving a reality, we need to go one step further. And the next step is 5G. With super fast yet ultra reliable connectivity, 5G V2X will allow vehicles, road infrastructure and other road users to coordinate trajectories, anticipating each other's maneuvers both inside and outside network coverage, making the roads safer and greener for all. Okay, so to summarize, and actually this video really says it uh, says it all. So I could perhaps go uh, stop here. But um, uh, to summarize, so CV2X really offers two different modes: uh, one communication mode that is network based, another one that is direct. As a network based, you have the connectivity as you have on your mobile phone. The vehicle, um, basically, the the the. The, the vehicle connects to the uh, mobile network. Um, and um, this is ensured by 4G uh, today and 5G upcoming always of almost uh, every, uh, in every parts of the world. So the, 
uh, direct connectivity. Uh, you have the connectivity between the different devices. It's a device to device communication. It's completely independent of the coverage of the cellular network. And it is done uh, using a, a, a specific uh, frequency band that is called the 5.9 gigahertz band for ITS uh, services. And it's harmonized around the world. So I, if we take a broader automotive connectivity landscape and what, what actually the vehicle manufacturers want to uh, look at in 5GA, so I mentioned the side link, so the device-to-device -device communication, it's complemented by the 4G, 5G. In, co in this combination basically makes the internet of vehicles. Uh, we uh, also saw in the video the, the vulnerable road users um, that we absolutely want them in the uh, safety ecosystem. This includes pedestrian cyclists, uh, but also e-bikes that are coming up and that are uh, uh, a big part of accidents, uh, mopeds, motorbikes, um, micro-mobility uh, vehicles, such as the, um, the, the small electric scooters that you can rent around, the, around different uh, cities. And the integration can be done via the, the smartphones that are used by the pedestrians or, or cyclists. Uh, but it can be also done uh, via direct radios, direct communication radios that are embedded in, in the e-bikes or motorbikes when you have power uh, to, um, to actually um, power them. Um, now, we have also seen a prospect of having a mobile, um, mobile smartphone that have a back and that you can uh, put an ad additional back on the phone uh, that would have then the short range capability, but uh, this um, did not uh, come to really to the market in, in Europe or in US. Um, so now beyond that, uh, what, what is very important is the guaranteed quality of service and the network slicing. Uh, I will say a few words later. Uh, edge computing, which introduced a new option to to answer the automotive needs. It, it's a kind of extension of the capabilities of the CV2X application to use the network as an external source of computing uh, power. Um, <clears throat> uh, it really unlocks the, the low latency issue that is uh, uh, related to uh, the, um, uh, the, the use of the mobile network. Uh, trust and authentication has always been uh, pretty important aspects, not only about data protection perspective, perspective, but also from a customer adoption and willingness to pay, uh, or even the, the willingness to turn on the, the device. And then um, uh, high accuracy positioning is also an important prerequisite, which is um, today based on uh, RTK techniques uh, enabled by transmission of GNSS correction via the 4G and 5G network, but also we can use high definition maps that uh, enable sub 10 centimeters relative uh, positioning, for example. So then the, finally in that slide, uh, the, the, the few components, they are not specifically made for uh, v, V2X communication, but they come with 4G and 5G. Here in this example, we have NB-IoT, which are then fully integrated in the uh, automotive connectivity landscape. In a nutshell, this brings the the this brings all the activities that we are um, uh, caring for, and um, we uh, put these together in uh, in a strategic uh, framework uh, based on eight different priority areas. All of them are contributing to our mission, uh, which is at the center here: connected mobility for people vehicles and transport infrastructure. <clears throat> and we are focusing on interoperable, deployable, secure and to end connectivity solutions. And in order to do that, we need to look at uh, priorities such as uh, the security and privacy in the trust priority area, the integration of the road infrastructure and the traffic managers in the digital roads area, enabling smart devices to contribute to the, uh, to the ecosystem in the vulnerable road user area, improving positioning, uh, 
um, in the precise positioning area, enabling interoperability between different devices in the interoperable ecosystem, making sure that cellular uh, networks are deployed and fast uh, tracked uh, the mobility services here in the um, mobile network area, uh, and also um, make sure that um, uh, I'm, more, I'm forgetting one, leveraging uh, on distributed cloud and edge computing here in the flexible service architecture. And finally, uh, making sure that we are adopting a, a, a sustained evolution of the technology through different standards uh, uh, adoptions. So now I'd like to look a little bit at the um, global technology perspective, if I can say that. Um, and what I yeah, uh, after that, I will show a few uh, use cases from different angles from the network and from the um, short range communication. And then I will come back to um, the use of the mobile network and its capabilities, for example, with edge computing. So first, what I want to put is a little bit of perspective on the evolution of the advanced driver assistance systems, uh, ADAS. And uh, over the last, what, 20, 15 years, ADAS has really evolved rapidly thanks to the evolution of the onboard sensors. And um, at the same time, so, sorry, uh, um, so, so the, yeah, um, the onboard sensors, which really help to, to avoid the, the, the collision the, really in a, in a safety critical manner and to mitigate uh, the risk. So we could call it collision avoidance kind of systems. Um, now we, we saw that on the other range that I show here, we have uh, systems that are informing. That's, that's more to, uh, in the realm of telematics, which has really evolved thanks to the mobile communication standards or mobile networks. Uh, we sometimes refer to vehicle to network or V2N. And uh, this helps to just inform the drivers about real time traffic information, but also sometimes about uh, dangerous um, uh, situations such as um, uh, end of queue warning uh, or uh, slippery roads, etc. I will illustrate that a bit later. Uh, that, that's uh, what we would call the risk avoidance. And so in between, um, the sensors-based solution and the V2N-based solutions, there is a role for the, this V2V and V2I aspect, which is essentially there to, to warn the driver about an imminent danger, but not necessarily to act uh, like uh, it is done with the uh, onboard sensors. And, and now we, we, we thought that V2V and V2I would happen faster than V2N. Uh, and so years passed by and what happened is that the gap between act, action and information actually narrowed down and um, the borders, and I'm going, I think there is an animation here that I'm trying to show. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, the borders between the role of the sensor and the role of the V2V have, have uh, faded. Uh, and, and the same happened actually between the borders of V2N and V2I. For an example, you know, nowadays we often talk about V2N2V for the uh, former V2V use cases that, that actually rely on the network. And perhaps I, I will give you a few examples later. Uh, so nevertheless, the short range component is still important in the eyes of the vehicle manufacturers. Well, first of all, they want to give themselves uh, uh, the, the possibility to be independent from the mobile network operators. That's one thing that's a bit of a strategic aspect. But uh, still, uh, they find that the complementarity between the sensor-based solutions, the short-range communication and the long-range communication um, are really essential if we want to have a, a comprehensive approach to um, the connectivity of the vehicle and, um, and then eventually leading to more and more automated driving capabilities. OK, that was a long story about this, but that was important as a background. Now. Um, at 5GA, what we did is to try, we said at one point, well, let, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about the next 10 years. And we have published this 
a roadmap that is trying to put together a few milestones around the, uh, around different uh, what we call swim lanes, but um, basically they are different categories. And uh, and uh, the, the the big challenge is that these the two sectors, telco and automotives, have different product deploy development cycle, and they have also different investment models. Uh, their product procurement models is different. So it is very important that over the 10 years, we know more or less you know, what is to be expected from the different um, uh, sectors. And um, so this roadmap gives tangible uh, um, examples of what kind of use case are expected at what time. Uh, it's a, it, as I mentioned, these swim lanes, it's um, four different development trends. One on traffic efficiency, one on safety, and two on automated driving. And the reason they are different lanes they, is basically that they are addressing different challenges in the automotive development, uh, which explains that they are separated in this roadmap. Um, so all, all the use cases that we have identified are, are, they are not displayed here, but at least uh, it gives a glimpse of what the future holds. So to be sure that we understand each other also, we are not in denial of all the work that was done over the past uh, using IEEE Wi-Fi based communication. We, we are just realistic that it did not happen. And instead of trying too hard, we, uh, we, really, we brought the short range into the 3GPP world uh, where the 4G and 5G is defined. So that it, enab it enables a uh, much more integrated approach that, um, that, um, that is embraced by the automotive uh, industry. Uh, there are still initiatives around the world in, in, on uh, using IEEE Wi-Fi based technologies, but eventually we think that the 5G, that with 5G and with all uh, vehicles getting connected, we have difficulties to understand how um, the, the 3 GPP uh, will will um, will not uh, prevail at the end. So, okay, I'll, I'll skip that one. Uh, basically, it was about why the vehicle manufacturers wanted to go from the old-fashioned DSRC and the CV2X. But basically, it says it's it's just um, a matter of market trend. It just uh, show uh, the CV2X is a newer technology, a newer radio. So therefore, better. Uh, it has a global footprint and gro global approach. Um, most of the upper layer um, uh, application layer aspects and most of the learnings that uh, we learned from the SRC over the 10 last years uh, can be reused. And uh, clearly, CV2X helps to uh, project ourselves into the 3GPP uh, standardization um, uh, uh, roadmap. So I mentioned 3GPP many times. Now, uh, I just want to mention that so 3GPP is the global organization that is standardizing uh, 3G, 4G, 5G uh, mobile network technologies. It's not all about um, um, smartphones, et cetera, especially when we are approaching 5G, because uh, the, um, the 5G, a new technology has really been uh, done in order to answer the industry need uh, from different angles, what, what we call the verticals. And these verticals are, um, for example, in this case, the automotive or the transport vertical. We took the needs of the automotive industry and then we brought it into 3GPP and these were translated into um, new radio access technologies and new core, te core network technologies. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give a Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X, allows vehicles to communicate with each other and everything around them. CV2X is based on the same radio technologies used for mobile networks around the world. It's defined by 3GPP, the global standardization organization for all mobile networks. Every year or so, new 3GPP releases gradually improve the standards. They have seamlessly evolved, leading up to 5G. Tens of millions of vehicles are already connected today. They exchange. Oops. 
Sorry, guys. Change valuable data on road safety and traffic efficiency via cellular mobile networks. To support growing automotive connectivity needs, Release 14 introduced LTE V2X in 2017, which integrates both direct and mobile network-based vehicular communications using the same radio. Advanced features enabling more advanced services, such as cooperative maneuvers or sensor sharing, will require the complementary 5G2X capabilities also defined in 3GPP. By 2022, worldwide deployment of basic safety services, including LTE V2X direct communications, will complement traffic information and local hazard warnings already widely installed today. The 5GAA roadmap predicts that automated vehicles will start getting the full-scale benefits of 5G as of 2026. Newer 5G V2X connected vehicles will continue to support LTE V2X for basic safety services, ensuring that 4G based vehicles with LTE V2X are still included in road safety solutions when 5G comes. How will this work? Simple really, in the same way that 3GPP standards ensure that you can still call your friends with your new 5G smartphone even if they use an old school flip phone. 5G V2X radios will seamlessly embed both LTE V2X and 5G, which is crucial to keep an inclusive connected car ecosystem. This is the advantage of being part of the same but evolving technology family. See V2X. If automated driving feels like a revolution, the underlying technology is the result of a steady evolution to ensure constant safety gains all over the world even if former technology releases are in play. CV2X is proven. Okay, great. So, um, um, yeah, well, the video actually tells it quite a lot. So the one, one thing that I wanted to insist on is that we really want to guarantee that the CV2X technology is eventually integrated in the connected vehicle uh, globally. And, uh, um, this this um, this may may seem a little bit of a um, uh, a dream, but uh, it will really it will really bring down the cost and the development time uh, for the connected vehicles. And uh, from our point of view, this momentum has started. Uh, all new vehicles connected uh, today uh, are have uh, some somehow. LTE V2X Advanced Pro, and um, by 2022, they will have a 5G connectivity. Um, I, I, at least um, that's what we, we have planned. Um, now, if I look at this Qualcomm reference um, architecture for, for, so basically this is an auto ch uh, automotive chipset, and um, this automotive chipset in the same uh, chip, in the same system, in the system on chip, in the same chip in which the 4G and 5G is actually uh, being implemented, um, the uh, release 14 and release 15 CV2X uh, PC5, the, so the short range communication is embedded in the same chipset. So that means that uh, uh, Qualcomm will produce uh, automotive grade chipsets that, are, that will be produced in, in millions of exemplars for the worldwide. There will be then uh, distributed in different places in the world and uh, based on what is where it is authorized, it will um, use uh, short range communication systems, uh, LTV2X that is embedded in the chip. <clears throat> so we see, we see this trend of different um, chips uh, evolving very fast in many different automotive chip vendors. Um, now that they are including a TV to X release 14 and 15. Uh, these products are mostly focusing on, on China at the moment because that's where things are happening. But the, the, end, uh, the end goal of these uh, companies in order to bring economies of scale is to be uh, worldwide vendors of these, uh, of these tools. So when it comes to the 5.9 gigahertz devices um, enabling direct communication, there is also um, 
um, quite a, a lot of activities. Uh, now some, some of them are embedding also the, the V2N part, but here I'm, I'm showing some roadside units that have been uh, recently um, certified uh, in Europe. Um, we are monitoring these different devices uh, for the worldwide market. And we recently published a list of available devices that are, um, uh, that are embedding um, LTV2X. Uh, we are also cooperating with some certification frameworks such as OmniAir, GCF, uh, with, whom, um, um, the, uh, with whom we have um, a regional agreement. Now, before I go further, and uh, ne the next uh, few sections will be more about use cases, and and so um, I, um, you, you may wonder why we make a difference between a mobile network uh, and also um, a roadside unit, which is a, a physically quite similar. It it, ha it is a transceiver. It has an uh, one or two antennas. Uh, it is fixed, um, no, it is connected to a fixed network uh, for, uh, for example, with a fiber. Uh, well, typically the roadside unit is connected to the road operator's network, the road operator, and, and, and it's only used for ITS purposes, for, for example, to send traffic information or uh, state inter intersection status like the red light phase. And, um, for a 4G and 5G base station, it is connected to the mobile network operator core network, which is in turn connected to the, to, to the internet. And um, so I think one of the main fear of the traffic manager is that they would have to rely on third parties, here the MNOs or the vehicle manufacturers, in order to collect data that is essential for a traffic uh, control business or, or mission. And so they, they see it essential to install also uh, along their road network, uh, these roadside units that will pick up some information so that they can, uh, uh, they can uh, make their, um, their road um, control and management. So the, the challenge is that the road operators are very, very fragmented and they are not very well uh, funded in terms of, of money. And uh, most important, they have, very little skill to install and maintain a network of roadside units. And so this leads to a kind of dilemma. So should the road operator collaborate with the mobile network operator or not? Um, there are pros and some cons, uh, but the economies of scale in, in, in terms of coverage and, in, and then in terms of cost uh, achieved by the MNO is, is in the order of, of 10 what, uh, what a roadside unit um, network would cost. And so and when we are talking about taxpayer money, uh, which, is, uh, which is the case, case for roads, road operators, it's hard to accept that such a high price for the independence towards the mobile network operators. Okay, okay. Uh, now I will look at more like a few examples of what we can do today with the mobile um, First on the network-based communication, but then after that, I will look at the uh, uh, short range. So the network-based communication, it's all the communication that goes through the mobile. Um, and obviously, it's IP-based kind of communication. So that means it, it connects to the internet. The principle is relatively simple. So here, I, I take an, an example of a dangerous curve or a slippery road that is detected by the sensor of, of one vehicle. Uh, this information is sent via the network to a service provider, uh, which process the data and cross-checks it, perhaps with other elements like a, um, a weather or something like that. So, um, and eventually uh, integrates it into, an, uh, into a, a map, uh, sometimes called here a loca location platform. Uh, this location platform integrates the static and dynamic data of the road network. And um, uh, this is then uh, eventually pushed towards the relevant vehicles uh, ahead of the area that they are approaching. So <clears throat> the vehicle 
also once once he received the information can cross check this information to, uh, according to its route and then warn the driver in due time um that was actually uh, earlier uh, that was actually provided by bmw and the same kind of of canvas is used in in other uh, brands so uh, this is really called uh, telematics basically uh and and it's um uh, so the, the example that is given here is, is from actually quite a long time ago, the Mercedes-Benz uh, E-Class in 2016. Uh, it uh, you, it uh, used the vehicle and its sensors to detect events, send them via the mobile network to the Daimler backend, and then um, it's centralized, it's filtered, it's aggregated. And what is interesting in here in this picture is that all the security and privacy issues are preserved thanks to this vehicle backend and the contractual basis that they have with the vehicle uh, driver. Um, so this kind of service also is interesting that it can be very fastly uh, scaled up to different markets, uh, US, Europe, and China. And also where uh, possible, it was using the information from in, uh, coming from the road operators. And I will give a few examples later. Now, this was 2016. How did it evolve? First, now all the, not only the A class, all the Mercedes Benz have this if they have a navigation system. And on top of that, uh, the information that is uh, brought uh, from the vehicle to the backend, now it's also shared to a third party, in namely here, the here cloud platform. And um, all these alarm uh, and these warnings can now be shared across other uh, vehicle brands and, uh, and manufacturers. So this really created a, a real ecosystem of uh, uh, thanks to the, the mobile network connectivity. Same here with the Volvo, uh, the connected safety package, which is also providing different kinds of alerts. Uh, and here, the, this is the, just a hazard light that are put on. It is transmitted. Uh, we just geolocate the, the car and then uh, the information uh, is uh, transmitted to the to the driver coming uh, on the way. So a little bit more complicated is when we start involving the the cities uh, and the city managers, and that's starting around the world. We have uh, interfaces uh, coming, uh, basically real time interfaces coming from the traffic urban traffic manager. The um, um, then the basically the, the, the red light information or the, the signal phase information is being transmitted in real time and at low latency uh, to the driver so that they can uh, adjust their speed when approaching uh, uh, a red light that is uh, red. Now, again, a little bit more ch uh, challenging is uh, when um, uh, it's actually a, a, an application that was deployed uh, um, two years ago by the BMW fleet in Bavaria. So the, it's not completely um, scaled up. It is all about emergency corridors that um, and the interaction between the vehicles and the emergency vehicles. And uh, this is very important in the eyes of the emergency vehicles to be able to notify the vehicles up front of uh, about an oncoming uh, uh, vehicle uh, and um, the vehicles. Um, but actually, I think that I have a video, so it is here. Um, when, when it's about the fire trucks or the ambulance, that's quite relevant. Now, uh, when we are talking about the police, that's also a little bit of a more challenging. And so, but you are going to see in the video that um, it um, should work.
Okay, and, and in the same spirit, we're seeing this kind of implementation in other parts of the world. Here, an implementation in Sweden that, that, that took really a, an, an additional stab uh, at this because they really made it completely operational. Um, so you can see the information chain, which gets pretty long in terms of actors involved. So, however, this is re really a pretty robust from an operational point of view. And, and still the latency is the, in the orders of, of, uh, of a couple of seconds. Uh, so you have the emergency vehicles that use the legacy uh, public safety network. The, um, uh, it uses a secure communication uh, to the emergency call dispatch, SOS uh, alarm, and then uh, to the mission control and planning uh, via a secure link and then through an interchange uh, with, uh, with um, um, the possibility to dispatch uh, the information to different vehicle manufacturers backend or even supply, uh, service suppliers. So uh, here another similar one, uh, which is uh, given as an example on road work, roadworks warning, and um, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on it. So now let, let me dive a little bit more in the uh, more innovative parts of the CV2X, which is a direct communication, sometimes called the, the PC5 interface in the 3GPP standards. So, so again, it's using the 5.9 gigahertz. It's an ITS band. It's, uh, it's using device to device communication and it's independent of the a mobile network. So even if you don't have coverage, you're going to be uh, um, covered. And then also, uh, it does not need a SIM card. Huh? Um, and the first goal with this uh, kind of connectivity is to make sure that basic safety is covered. Um, when we are talking about basic safety, we often uh, also include all these day one services that we pr um, talk about in, in Europe. Uh, for example, emergency electric uh, brake light, traffic turn assist, um, uh, signal phase and timing uh, that I was talking about earlier, but this time it's uh, with a PC5 interface, interaction with renewable road users, intersection collision warning, and also uh, here stas stationary vehicle warning, uh, again, that I was mentioning earlier, but this time again, it's with the short range communication. And uh, so this PC5, um, uh, the, the same way with the SRC has been demonstrated in different parts of the world. And uh, now it's really uh, uh, the, the, the time when uh, this is brought to the market in, in mass number. And especially, I will show it in the next slide. Um, uh, it will, it was, um, it's really started in China. So, but that, that was for the basic safety. And so, What's next for the forthcoming standard that is uh, that was standardized actually last uh, um, last uh, October? Uh, it is uh, really truly truly the, the the creation of a combination between um, basic safety use cases and advanced driving use cases. And it's called uh, five, what we call five G V two X. It uses two radio interfaces. One one that is called LTV2X and the, the other one NRV2X and they are complementary and they can work in the same uh, ITS band along to each other, alongside each other. So uh, what could we expect with this? We uh, can expect um, uh, the perception aspects. So especially in terms of sharing of sensors with other vehicles and roadside past planning performances, so sh sharing intention and trajectory for faster and safer maneuvers in real time, local updates with a much more accurate HD map, including the dynamic element that I was talking about earlier, and then the, the coordinated maneuvering, exchanging intentions and sensor data so that the vehicles can coordinate uh, their trajectory uh, optimally between each other. And so when it comes to uh, this 5G V2X, what we like to uh, in this is the, co the concept of complex interaction use cases. And, and these use cases are requiring in interactions of two or more participants uh, with exchange of messages on which they agree 
And these messages depend, so they depend on each other in order to take appropriate actions. Uh, a, a good example of these uh, with the, um, uh, was at the advanced cooperative driving demonstration, uh, which was uh, showed at CES in 2019, together with, um, with Ford, Audi, Ducati, and Qualcomm. And I think I have- We're here in conjunction with the 5GAA quarterly event. We are here demonstrating the world's first showcase of Cellular Vita X technology. We're using boards developed by Qualcomm Technologies to communicate between Ford and Audi vehicles to trigger safety critical apps to prevent collisions and to allow for general alerts about things like cyclists crossing the street. Okay, oops, I have a little uh, issue here, but uh, anyway, so um, so what I wanted to show is to you, show you the, the CES um, uh, demonstration, but I can give uh, some other examples of exciting and 5G enabled use cases. Uh, first, uh, cooperative parking, which, which extends towards automated valley parking. In the cooperative parking use case, uh, a vehicle request other vehicles in the neighborhood to notify about available parking space. And during the, manu the, the, the parking maneuver, it can request the other vehicles to, to move slightly out of the, the parking space so that uh, it gives space for the parking maneuver. And then um, um, this uh, use case can be applied on parking garages themselves, but also on road parallel parking also. Now, another use case is the, um, is the group start in which vehicles arrive at the uh, traffic lights and are uh, located at the, uh, are located to a group of vehicles going in the same direction in the, in the intersection. And uh, we, it, it integrates the start of the group. Uh, it, it coordinates the start of the group in order to uh, travel quicker through uh, one or more lights um, traffic light based on the vehicle routes, and um, it uh, both accelerates the overall traffic flow and improves also the road capacity in the cities. Now, the this one is about VRU crossing. Uh, it's a it's a when a pedestrian indicates its, its intention to cross the road and establish a dialogue with the upcoming um, vehicles. So the the result is that it, both parties confirm their intent and the vehicle stops and the, the VRU can cross safely. It's a bit stu stupid in one way, but uh, it's interesting when there are no zebra crossing that are present. And, and on top of that, it's, it's put in combination of the school bus um, uh, use case, which is uh, actually when the school bus drops off, it activates this VRU crossing uh, request. Now, one interesting one is the virtual road monitoring, which is about uh, using the vehicle cameras that are on the, on the, uh, on the, equipped on the vehicles to take pictures of a road situation so that it transmits this information securely to an emergency uh, services or, or to a traffic manager so that the, the emergency vehicle uh, or emergency service can know what it is all about and can act more optimally. Cooperative traffic gaps is a use case in which a vehicle informs all other vehicles in, in the traffic flow that it has an intended maneuver. <coughs> it's typically a road merge, which requires other vehicles to agree on the most appropriate maneuver. The vehicles in the traffic flow coordinate with each other, uh, whether they are capable and interested in creating this gap and thereby providing a space-time slot on the oncoming, uh, for the oncoming uh, vehicle. And then finally, uh, the teleoperator driving use case, uh, we looked at different approaches to control the vehicle depending on the level of interest uh, required for a simple monitoring uh, of, um, so we, we have the options between a, a, a simple monitoring of the maneuver and all the way towards a full remote control of the vehicle. And this, in this use case, um, uh, we, yeah, uh, basically it, it sounds a little bit more futuristic, but I wouldn't say this because we, we have a lot of examples 
where this teleoperation is actually happening in public transport like metro, light rail, or driverless uh, shuttles, but also in construction sites, in mining, in harbor. So we all these are using the same uh, principles in terms of uh, teleoperation. And so therefore, we think that um, uh, it's quite uh, a low hanging uh, use case that can be applied in different um, areas, first the confined areas, and then eventually in more open areas. And um, okay, um, the teleoperation is, is, by the way, not a driverless system. It's uh, in fact, uh, the vehicles themselves don't necessarily need to be capable of a higher level of automation. It is, um, um, it, it is, uh, it just needs a good connectivity and uh, good actuators to, uh, to actually uh, uh, replicate uh, the, um, the request of the teleoperator. Okay, now, <clears throat> now I'm, I leave all the use case part, etc., and I uh, look a little bit at what, what is happening around the world. Now let's look at China. China is, a, is the country where the most, uh, most of the vehicles are sold with LTE and 5G connectivity. In 2020, China became the first connected automotive market with 11 million of connected vehicles, and that represents about 50% of the vehicles sold. This is to be compared with the mat more maturing um, markets, which where we have 64% in Europe, 82% in, in, in uh, US. So still not the same proportion, but uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to the volume, uh, the 11 million connected vehicles is, is really staggering. Uh, there is a lot of room for de development in China, um, and, uh, and, and that room is taken up by the short-range communication at the moment. Uh, so China has allocated 20 megahertz for the 5.9 gigahertz um, uh, harmonized ITS band for the operation of LTV to x direct And the uh, target deployment is that 50% uh, of uh, uh, new cars will be uh, equipped in 2025 and uh, in 2030, all new vehicles will be equipped. So in the last 12 months, six vehicle manufacturers that are listed here have um, already put on sale new models with LTV to x direct and four new models will be announced uh, within the next month. So it's totaling, uh, if we if we look at this list, 14 new models that are on sale as, a, the, as of the end of 2021. So the kind of applications supported have uh, been standardized worldwide. I mentioned it earlier. This is no different in China. It's quite a consistent. And they have also these day two next steps um, uh, uh, use cases that are coming up later. Uh, and by the way, many of these are using uh, both connectivity to the network as well to the direct communication. Um, so, um, so it's a pretty complementary approach. In, interestingly also, um, <clears throat> the uh, Chinese government has uh, uh, had a, traf a 5G traffic, no, sorry, a Chinese 5G strategic uh, deployment plan where they are planning 40,000 kilometers of highways, which are uh, which will be equipped and covered with minimum <clears throat> uh, quality of service of uh, of 5G. Um, in in the meantime, also more than one million 5G base stations have already been installed across the three mobile network operators. This is really massive. Um, and uh, we also see that uh, some cities are gradually also equipping with short range equ equipment uh, their intersections. Uh, we have documented 900 roadside units in five large scale deployments initiative in 2020. And in 2021, we are uh, documenting another 3,300 roadside units for for, uh, by the end of 2021. One interesting development is the 100 kilometers section of the G50, which leads all the way to Shanghai uh, between Shizhou and Chongqing. Um, this is a winding uh, uh, highway with several tunnels in the mountain 
uh, the longest tunnel is 7.3 kilometer and, and the motorway will be this time 100% covered with roadside units, including smart sensors, etc. And uh, things are a little bit complicated in, in Europe. Now, uh, the 5.9 gigahertz is, is based on the services, not on the technology. That's the, therefore, the, the, it's a technology agnostic approach to the spectrum allocation. Anyone that would like to operate a radio and that is delivering ITS uh, services can do that as long as it's not harmfully interfering with others. And in, um, and in Europe, on top of the uh, safety ITS, we have 20 megahertz for the non-safety road ITS, and then 10 megahertz that are shared with urban rail, uh, mostly uh, we, we see it as an I2V uh, communication. And then so 5GA has uh, worked out and has already um, uh, suggested uh, that um, the Wi-Fi based communication and the 3GPP based communication can coexist uh, by operating each on separate bands called preferred bands, uh, which are depicted here. And, um, and we, what we want to see is how the market is going to actually converge uh, over the next three to five years. <clears throat> but at the same time, what happens is that the 5G action plan in Europe is is targeting deployment along 26,000 kilometers of designated 5G corridors, where they require minimum quality of service. A lot of focus is on uh, seamless user experience across the different European borders. And um, uh, 5GA um, has been uh, working in coordination with different funded projects uh, where we are seeing uh, some cross-border activities. So many of the vacuum manufacturers, rather than focusing on the short range, they, they capitalize on, on the, 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 the good deployment of LTE and 5G deployment in, 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 uh, in Europe. And we, we see that also small, some cities and road operators are starting to put interfaces um, and exchange uh, traffic in real-time traffic information, such as red light information, et cetera. Uh, even runway driver has been uh, announced as a um, 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 uh, uh, national wide deployment in, in the Netherlands, but for example. Okay, in the US, there has been a lot of evolution dur during the last months. Uh, we'll not go too much into the details. Um, the FCC commissioner voted on modernizing the 5.9 gigahertz for the, the, the V2X Direct. Um, it has reallocated uh, the upper side of the uh, of the 5.9 gigahertz to uh, CV2X, and uh, the the older DSRC roadside units have two years to terminate operation, uh, either by turning off the equipment or by migrating the, to CV2X. So it is important to note that Ford is one of the only vacuum manufacturers outside China that has announced a start of production of ltv 2 x equipped vehicles. Other vacuum manufacturers have, have done some deployment projects in different parts of the, of the US. Uh, as examples, we have the road worker protections in Virginia, red light intersection, uh, interaction in uh, 30 cities uh, in US and then uh, recently, the school bus that I was talking about in Atlanta, which may be uh, potentially extending to tens of thousands of uh, school buses across, across uh, the US. Now, I'm aware of time and I'm just uh, going through a few um, key features about the 5G that I wanted to mention that are close to our heart. Um, first of all, I mentioned it is the capability of the network to actually slice itself. That, that, that means that some parts of the communication <clears throat> using 5G can be dedicated to one specific slice, such as the mobile broadband. And then another slice at the same time on the same radio uh, and independent of it can guarantee um, uh, that uh, we would have a low um, um, ultra reliable low latency uh, communication. And that's really essential for the automotive manufacturer 
are having one telecommunication unit to be able to deliver in the car different uh, differentiated uh, communication um, um, uh, quality of service. So another part that is uh, quite um, challenging and interesting for the vacuum manufacturers is what we call the predictive quality of service. So now when um, a vehicle is actually on the road and, um, and is planning its route, uh, we know that there are some dips or some, some gaps of coverage or some gaps of quality of service over the uh, route of the vehicle. And so the mobile network can actually in advance notified about these gaps of quality of service and the vehicles can then take appropriate action. Uh, for example, by um, uh, returning from level four uh, automated automation towards uh, level three or level two automation and ask the driver to pay attention again to the road so that it can intervene if needed. Now, another very interesting aspect of the 5G network is the edge computing. Actually, uh, this edge computing was really uh, already existing in LTE networks, but now it puts it into an additional level by um, <clears throat> applying, the, uh, uh, applying the, the, this principle that I just talked about in the slicing and uh, the guarantee of the quality of service. And, uh, at 5G, we have especially looked at this and looking uh, looking at the time. I'm not sure I'm going to have time to really browse through it, but um, I can I can quickly uh, uh, look at it in the next slides. Um, so one thing that is really uh, was seen as a barrier or even a challenge uh, uh, is that all the aspects of cross MNO operation for edge computing as well as cross OEM operation have been um, now addressed. Now we have to put them into place. Uh, basically, what we want is to make sure that the vehicle running on one mobile network operator will be able to receive services from another edge computing that is running on another mobile network. And um, I, will, I will say a little bit uh, late, I will say a little bit more later, but I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time. So, now, <clears throat> let, let's dive a little bit, five slides on mobile edge computing or multi-access edge computing and what we have done at 5GA. Uh, so uh, edge computing is basically offering uh, um, this, uh, what I said earlier, uh, cloud computing uh, capabilities at the edge of the network. Uh, this unlocks very low latency and high bandwidth for the uh, for the different use cases. And in, in a sentence, edge computing um, creates a, a, a numerous little cloudlets uh, at the fringe of the network, and and that cloudlet is replicated uh, in every um, edge, so that um, uh, so that uh, the the, the back end, the, so that the mobile network does not have to reach the back end every time there is a connectivity need. So um, I'll, I'll go through the illustration here. So that's really my last slides. The, the, the deployment model is relatively simple. Vacant manufacturers and service providers choose to host their service at the edge. Uh, because they want to offer a higher degree of quality of service to the customers, but also they want to offload um, the data traffic between the edge and between the mobile network uh, and uh, the backend. Uh, so the service um, are then hosted here at the edge. Now it's, you, it's depicted as a, an antenna, one edge. It's not always like that. You know, you can have, uh, I think that you know, for many years, we had um, a seven edge computing for the whole uh, Netherlands. So it's not, it's, of course, you can scale up. And then as, as the need grows, then you just can uh, scale up and increase the number of, um, of, um, of uh, edge computing. 
but you uh, you can start with just a relatively low number of edge. Um, so what was I going to say? So we are faced with uh, vehicles that uh, have their own set of sensor communicating with other vehicles that are not necessarily connected to the same network. And so they, they may not interpret the sensors the same way and edge computing uh, facilitates that. And um, a vehicle may subscribe to, uh, to a service which are hosted on the edge of the other MNO. I said that earlier, um, or sometimes both MNO are hosting the same service in the same geographic area. And uh, then that means the edge needs to coordinate between each other in order to transmit and, and um, exchange the right information. So even more challenging is, the, is when you are going from one country to the other and you need to uh, make sure that the edge uh, service is continue, continuing across um, um, the, uh, the border and, and eventually also replicated at the edge of a roaming um, mobile network operator. And um, <clears throat> additionally, what, the, what we are uh, identifying, what happens when other communication channels are added to the picture, um, here, the roadside units, uh, which are, for example, providing the red light phase and timing. Uh, should this information also be available at the edge? How do we do that? And should even the roadside unit itself be integrated in the, uh, in, in be, or be, or act as an edge itself? And um, now the Another aspect is how do we integrate the roads, uh, the reliable road users? This is, uh, it is possible to monitor pedestrians' movements so that we can we keep them safe. Now, um, how should we organize the information flow? How should the pedestrian smartphone report its position uh, in some way? Or, or should, the, for example, the camera or other sensors track the movement and and uh, and report? Uh, the positions um, without the help of the smartphone of the users. And then finally, I wanted to illustrate also the challenges with the uh, third party services. So we have third party services such as a real time traffic manager or um, uh, that is providing information to an OEM backend and then eventually this, this information is provided to the vehicle, but um, it would be sometimes much easier that this um, OEM or this um, third party a service is then replicated also at the edge. And so, um, so this, this uh, starts to be uh, sometimes a, a bit challenging. Okay. And then I will stop here. Perhaps when I can go, just go through a few conclusions. Um, so the telco and the automotive industry have promoted this convergence towards the global CV2X standards. The vehicles connected to the network and cloud services are already a reality today. The CV2X deployment benefits are from the 5G momentum and are linked uh, to the investment. So therefore, we really are surfing on a, on a bigger wave. And um, we have already seen some um, uh, examples of uh, introduction of the um, CV2X direct technology. Uh, there is some uncertainty in different parts of the world, but um, we still believe that the combination between network-based and direct connectivity is still really the way forward for us. So that brings me to the end, and I don't, I have not monitored the question, so I don't know if there is any. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Maxime. That was. Um certainly in a interesting uh, presentation um, and yes we've uh, we do have quite a number of questions that have come up in the the Q&A um, which we'll 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 do our best to get through if you're happy to stay with us yeah yeah of course I am yeah. no problem. Um, fortunately um, I'm able to jump the queue with regards to the question so perhaps I could um, field my question to you first um, in a uh, you know a, a highly populated urban environment 
um, where you have um, 5G connected vehicles, uh, but also you have a high number of um, pedestrians and cyclists with 5G enabled devices in their pocket or their backpack. Um, do you perceive or, or has any thought been given to um, potential conflicts? Um, I'm thinking of examples um, such as if you have, um, say, a, a public transport, like a, if you have a bus that's 5G connected, that you have multiple passengers getting on and off that are also uh, carrying 5G devices um, next to a cycle lane with a cyclist with a 5G device. Um, how do you manage that data flow and how do you uh, prevent conflict of information with regards to you know is, is a pedestrian on on this this bus is a pedestrian in a taxi or an uber um how, how do you deal with devices coming in and out of of smart connected vehicles so there i mean and i'm, I'm glad i illustrated the edge computing in in this respect because this is really a role of the edge computing to learn about you know specific behaviors and 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 um, and ways the the uh, the different road users are actually uh, traveling and so um, it is only by applying some kind of a artificial intelligence to that you will uh, be able to recognize that actually uh, oh uh, this this pedestrian was actually waiting at this spot that was this is actually very close to our bus. Um, a stop and therefore uh, the, this um, vehicle, act, uh, the, the bus arrived and then and then as um, uh, the, the the pedestrian is now part of the bus. Uh, so there there are a lot of uh, of um, of um, a potential by uh, using this information um, and and then um, and let's say uh, uh, consume it at the edge of the network. We we don't. There is no need or intention to actually share this information uh, and especially not identify the information to a specific user. What we want is that this is consumed at the edge and then, uh, and then that can be um, uh, used for, uh, for safety reasons or for other aspects such as but that in this case, you know, that the that a bus has arrived and we know which bus it uh, came and and we we know exactly in which direction it's going. Um, now um, now we, there is a concept of uh, when there are a lot of pedestrians there is a concept of clustering. So instead of each of the the members of of a cluster reporting their uh, position, what happens as soon as a group forms. Uh, um, the two are recognized at the same at the same position or going along the same direction, and they are asked not to report their position at the same uh, uh, together. So, but uh, rather in a in in one in one group in one cluster, um, and that's that's both done for the connectivity to the network and also to the connectivity with the. Uh, with the, the other vehicles so in terms of direct communication. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you very much. Um, okay, so we'll dive then into the uh, the Q and A list. Um, I guess we'll uh, we'll start with the the questions with the the most upvotes. Um, so the first one there: um, Who owns the data gathered from these interactions? Uh, mm -hmm. The mobile network provider, the car manufacturer, or the customer? <laughs> So the, for it, it's a recurrent question. Huh? So uh, for me and, and for many, and you would ask a legal um, advisor, there is no such a thing as group, uh, as, as data ownership. Um, that does not exist. What you do is to you authorize or you license you know, the use of the data to other parties. Huh? So and that's very and a very important difference. Now, um, there are also uh, data that is generated by the vehicle and that is used, uh, that is um, uh, transmitted via a, a radio that is, that is not paid for by the, uh, by, by the, by the driver itself. So um, there are, if you look at the architecture of, the, of some of the thematic units today, um, there is the radio, the 4G, 5G radio, which where you put your SIM card, and then next to it, there is a 
4G, 5G radio that is actually um, paid for, the subscription is paid for by the vehicle manufacturers at the, be at the beginning of the lifetime of the vehicle for its entire lifetime. So um, there are these inform the information that is being transmitted is not uh, uh, private information, but it's rather, you know, a lot of health information, monitoring information, a lot of uh, different aspects that are uh, also needed for uh, to provide um, what is it called uh, these uh, added value services that you have with when you are connecting your car to the to the to the mobile phone etc with your app uh, so that that um, that data that is actually provide um, paid for by the vehicle manufacturer is under a specific agreement that you sign when you buy your, your car and um, and uh, comes with also um, you know an agreement that you when you agree to use the applications and so uh, this data is not uh, so normally you press on yes I want to use this application yes I agree to share my data and and there there is uh, some of this data that is then um, reused so I'm not saying owned but I'm saying that it's reused uh, by the vehicle manufacturers for different purposes that you have agreed on in the, in the in in the the contract that you have signed with the with the vehicle manufacturer. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, our next top question: um, How is the coexistence? Oh, it just moved someone. Ah, okay, how is the coexistence of ITS vehicle systems and FRM CS rail systems managed? Uh, that run in parallel in terms of parallel ways and also sharing the same 5G technology or spectrum? Oh, um, FR, FRMCS. Um, huh. Now, I guess that we are talking about light rail, are we? Or um, I, I hope that we are. Um, so, because I... Huh. Um, so if we are talking about the light rail um, ITS services that are uh, using a specific band, the 5.9 gigahertz band, uh, so they have 20 megahertz and then for some reason CEPT uh, in the, the European uh, Frequency uh, Authority, they decided that, ah, yeah, but that's, no, that's not the same, sorry. Okay, someone was uh, commenting on it. <clears throat> Okay, um, well, I am uh, not completely sure in this case how this is uh, coexistence is, the, which coexistence is being actually mentioned. So when I was still talking about the light rail uh, communication in the 5.9 gigahertz, that was something else apparently. So the F FRMCAS is, uh, is basically uh, understood, it's the evolution of the G GSMR, that's fine, but I am not aware that it's using actually um, uh, it's sharing uh, bands. Um, I, I actually don't, I would doubt it is sharing the same bands. Um, yes, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, worry too much about that. Honestly, um, um, these are bands that have been uh, allocated to the, the rail uh, system a long time ago now is are these bands going to be reused for 5g uh, services I'm, I'm not completely sure um what i could do is to check uh, cross check again but um i um, i can't tell exactly how this uh, going to be okay thank Sorry. you very much okay. um how do mobile networks monetize these services uh will you subscribe for say traffic and or safety on a monthly charge so uh, that's an interesting thing. It's a, it's um, the mobile network operators. They are um, in general um, providing to the vehicle manufacturers a lifetime subscription to the um, uh, to the to the vehicle manufacturer. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to give you a price, but this order of of um, the, the order of price is, uh, is very, very uh, surprising. So, um, and in general, what it offers also is a, 
of worldwide roaming service. So that means that you can go to in any country and then still have the, um, the be uh, subscribed to the mobile network. So at the end of the day, it's not necessarily the mobile networks that are monetizing the service. That's it's the vehicle manufacturers that have to find a way to, to monetize. Now, um, this comes with the different added value services that they would offer. Now, I don't think that any of the vehicle manufacturers would monetize uh, the safety services or the traffic information, but this is uh, brought as a basis of, uh, for the, the basis subscription. And then when you want, for example, a teleoperator driving or a, a valet parking driving, valet parking uh, service, uh, that may require additional uh, resources, um, uh, additional um, uh, payments uh, that I, I can't I can't tell exactly how they will monetize it or how they will model this uh, this payment. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, next question down. Um, <coughs> yes. I think that's probably uh, suggest that maybe Volvo went on your early yes. slides. Yes, Volvo was part of the slides. No, it's Volvo cars. Uh, Volvo Trucks is not part of, uh, meaning Volvo Group is not part of the um, of the 5GA. In general, uh, it's true that for some reason we have not that many presence of the truck manufacturers in in the 5GA discussions. Okay. Okay, uh, which uh, 5G frequency bands are used for uh, V2N and V2V uh, and are these licensed or unlicensed? No, the, so the, the 5G frequency bands, so if we talk really about 5G frequency bands, they are pioneer bands at the 3.5 gigahertz in general. Uh, that's where you can um, unlock what, what the slice, what I mentioned, the slice of ultra reliable low latency communication. Uh, now, um, this is not going to be available all the time, and that's why you have this uh, predictive quality of service uh, uh, capability. Um, yeah, uh, when we are talking about V2V, this is an unlicensed band, which is called a license exempt band uh, at 5.9 gigahertz, and therefore it's um, technology agnostic. Whereas the, the V2N obviously is a, a technology uh, driven uh, allocated band because you pay for it. So the, the mobile network operators pay a, a great deal of money for for uh, um, for using these bands and, and monetizing them. Next. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, you mentioned um, precise location uh, as part of the system. Um, what's the source of that location uh, network or GNSS? Uh, it's 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 both. So. So I tried to say it, uh, but perhaps I went too fast. It's a uh, it's, uh, precise position, point precise positioning. So PPP, RTK, real time kinetics. So PPP, RTK, but this is in general enabled. Uh, so what you, in the past, when if you do, if you use EGNOS or if you use other, uh, you, 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 uh, you try to rectify or to, to correct the GNSS position um, via uh, some information from uh, from a radio, for example. But uh, what is done today is that it's uh, with a much more accuracy. You you correct the GNSS information using the 4G 5G network by providing the correction information at, at a much more accurate place uh, based on your position. And so that really allows a very accurate positioning of the of the two networks of the <coughs> of the vehicle on the road network. Um, now, the, I mentioned also there are other capabilities uh, such as using map-based information um, that is provided via the network um, and um, use that map-based information in order to um, to um, um, uh, correct your relative positioning um, related to things that you detect with your sensors on the vehicle. Okay. 
Is there a lot of questions? Uh, well, we've got 12 more, but maybe we'll oh, see how we go. Really we don't want to, nice. uh, <laughs> we don't want to, uh, yeah. Uh, no, that's good. I'm, I'm pleased. <laughs> um, so you mentioned um, interoperability uh, and availability all over the world. Um, how is the spectrum issue addressed for countries like the UK where the spectrum is not available for this kind of application? Hmm. The five, uh, so if we are talking about the 5.9 spectrum, it's, uh, it's the ITS spectrum. It's harmonized almost around everywhere around the world. Uh, there are some differences, uh, but not, not so much. And um, yeah, uh, so, so interoperability is mostly an issue uh, if you have a DSRC um, for short range communication a DSRC Wi-Fi based uh, radio and then a LTE V2X 3GPP PC5 radio. You just put them next to each other, even though they are transmitted at 5.9 gigahertz in the same band, they, they want to understand each other. It's not the same uh, technology, radio technology. So uh, so when, when this happens, what we, we, we recommend is that um, both vehicles then send uh, information to the network, and then we, we use the, the, what I mentioned, the V2N2V uh, as, a, as a workaround uh, when two radios are not compatible. Okay, thank you. Um, so it looks like we've got a new top question with three votes. Um, what about the car that isn't on the V2X network, um, relying on just the driver? Uh, will a network enabled car be able to determine if the car in front isn't on the network and may therefore do something unexpected? I will have to read this uh, a few times, so I'm sorry, I, I can't directly answer. Okay. So I think uh, if I understand it, the question is basically about ident identification of non-connected cars yeah yeah but i i know but it's i think it requires a longer answer so i don't think that we have the time but okay I, um for the there there is one other how long is this expected rollout of this technology so so the big problem is in terms of uh, penetration of the vehicles uh, of the number of vehicles that have the same um the the the, the, the device to device communication and so <clears throat> What we, what we say is that let's make sure first that all vehicles are connected to the network. That, that's the first pla place. Make sure that they exchange information. And then on top of that, make sure that they, it has these little short range communication devices. And that will take five to even perhaps 10 years. You know, by if, even if all vehicles are equipped today, you're going to have, uh, you're going to, have to wait another um, five years to get even to, to 20%. So you, if you look at the curves of uh, penetration curves of the new vehicles, so it takes some, sometimes, of course. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, but there was a few nice questions. So um, thanks a lot. Yes, uh, apologies to those um, whose questions we didn't uh, get to, but um, I think we've, yes, we've, we've, uh, <laughs> we've had uh, a lot of Maxime's uh, time and uh, I'm sure he's ready for a, a drink and a, uh, and a relax yeah. this evening. <laughs> um, drink some water now. Because yes. I lost my voice. Uh, yeah. um, so, so thank you for all those who attended. Um, and I, I'm sure if you you had a question um, that you're, you're particularly keen to um, have answered, I, I'm, I'm sure Maxime wouldn't be um, against us. Um, perhaps allowing you to to email him after the event. Of course. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so uh, once again, thank you very much, Maxime, and uh, thank you for, for speaking to us this evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, then. Okay, thank you.